One thing I love about uh, that song, just getting to belt out hallelujah, uh, oh sing hallelujah, uh, a word that, that means y'all praise Yahweh. <laughs> it's a command. You know, when we sing that, we are saying to one another, praise Yahweh. It's a, a good command. Um, we can do that now as we uh, turn our attention to communion, uh, to partake in the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we want you to be able to see God's word open on your own lap. So if, if you don't have a Bible, you want one, you can just raise your hand and these men will be glad to get you a copy. And open up to Psalm number 22. Psalm 22. This psalm has been rightly called the gospel according to David because in it, David gives us a detailed articulation of what from his perspective would be Christ's future sufferings as well as subsequent glories, his future sufferings and subsequent glories. I want to just draw our attention to really one verse for the purpose of remembering Christ and proclaiming his death in communion this morning. And that is verse one, just after the title, David writing prophetically of Christ from the first person perspective. So putting my words in Christ's mouth, he says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my salvation are the words of my groaning. That's a phrase that is probably not unfamiliar with anyone in the room. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just notice in these words of Christ, words that Christ uttered, when he fulfilled them perfectly on the cross, it's a question. The psalm begins with this question, and this is not a question that comes from ignorance. Christ is not unaware why he has been forsaken by God. Uh, this is a question that is really intended to express dismay, distress, that this is happening. It's similar to what we read in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot vanity? The reason's clear, and yet this is astonishing and distressing that this is occurring. That's what's behind this question. And the reason for it is bound up in the question, you have forsaken me. God, the Father, left Christ. We know that God is everywhere. He hasn't left the scene as if he's no longer present. The point is that he has entirely consigned Christ to death. He has left Christ no hope, no help to be rescued from this current trial. He will suffer all the way unto death. And so God has left him with no help left him in the sense that he has entirely consigned him to the torment that he's experiencing. But I want you to just note, in addition to the question and the reason that we see here, just notice the faith that is bound up in the very question being asked. Look again, to whom does Christ address his question? God. And what does he call God? Not just God, God, why have you forsaken me? But who's God? My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? Though God has left Christ in his dying moments to die, Christ has not left God. Christ will not leave God. He will not abandon God in these dying moments. And that's even 
uh, further illustrated in the passage. He, he repeats numerous times throughout the passage, my God, my God. The point is that Christ claims God. He owns the God who is forsaking him. He wants God. He loves God. He fears God. His father, even in these dying moments. What was the reason for this forsaking of Christ? Why did Christ need to express such adamant hope, faith, trust in God in these moments? Why was Christ's salvation, rescue from death so far? Well, it was for your salvation, Christian. Christ was left by God to save you. He bore sins he did not commit for you, believer. This is why. For the first time and only time in all of eternity, there was some sort of distance between the Father and the Son. And just let that sink in for a moment. Christ was willing, God the Father was willing to endure such a separation so that you could be reconciled, so that you could be at peace, so that you might enter into a reconciled, harmonious relationship with the triune God. It was worth it to him so that his glorious grace and mercy would forever be displayed in this one act of Christ's crucifixion. Perhaps all of us here do not believe that. Perhaps you're still resistant to submission to Christ as king, holding out hope that your own righteousness might justify you, to see what lengths God would go to save those who believe and to still not believe, this is, is worthy of the wrath of God. Every Christian knows this. Before you believed, you, I, we were worthy of the wrath of God because of our unbelief. And so I want to encourage us to, to consider these truths, uh, to lift up thankful hearts, to lift up worshipful hearts to the Lord, in light of what Christ has done for us, to experience this abandonment of God for you, for your sake, even sins that maybe you committed this morning on the way, on the way here. Christ saves sinners. You've received forgiveness, believer, because of his willingness to endure this for you. And so as the men come in, pass out bread, and the juice. Take them when you're ready. And those who do not yet believe, I want to encourage you to just not take. Let those pass by you. But do consider where you stand before God. Recognize that the abandonment that Christ experienced so that he could endure God's wrath in these moments, you too will experience something similar as you are abandoned by any mercy one day if you continue in your unbelief to only know the wrath of God forever. That does not have to be your destiny, but you must humble yourself before the Lord and repent. And so men come, serve us, take communion on your own believer when you're ready, and I'll be back to pray.